This is FRM Part 2, Book 1, Market Risk Measurement and Management, and the chapter on Parametric Approaches, Extreme Value. For those of you that have looked at this chapter, you might find it a little bit daunting, but I'm hoping that you thought this was a really cool chapter. And I'm going to try to convince you of that by the end of this slide deck, because it's really just an extension of some of the things we've been talking about in some previous chapters. But as many times I am want to do, I'm going to give you a sports analogy here. You know, we're in the middle of football season, NFL football. I was thinking about field goals and I was thinking about the distribution of field goals. And I thought, you know what, uh, if you take a look at some distances, you know, like from zero yards at the goal line to 15 or 20 yards and then 20 to 40, and 40 to 60, clearly there's a distribution of those field goals that are made. And surely there are a lot more field goals that are made from 20 yards than there are made from 50 yards. But then I started to think, you know what, what's an extreme value example in this case? So I went back to 2017 and during the NFL season, including the playoffs, there were somewhere around 960 field goals attempted during the season and somewhere around 830 of them were made. So you can imagine whatever that distribution might look like. But of those 960 that were attempted, only six were attempted from 60 yards and beyond. And of those six, only two were made. So we're not really interested in this chapter and all the stuff that goes on in regular football games, you know, a 20 or a 40 or a 50 yard field goal. We're interested in that extreme case from 60 to 70 yards. And the interesting thing about this is that the total field goals attempt and made during the course of the season probably has its own distribution. But those in the extreme cases in that 60 to 70 yard area, there's no reason to think that that distribution has any link to the distribution of regular field goal distributions. I think statisticians call that the uh, domain of attraction. But anyway, I want you to think of extreme values. I have a couple of examples in a, in a later slide, but let's first look at these learning objectives. And so I, I think the good news is that we have a lot of explaining to do, a lot of describing to do, and a lot of comparing to do. And so we should be able to take some of the mathematics of the chapter and extract just enough so that we can explain the importance and challenges of extreme values and risk management, ex describe the uh, EVT. We're going to take a look at kind of a natural method, this, uh, this POT approach, peaks over a threshold. Then we're going to contrast those. Then we're going to look at a GPD. And then the last slide or two, uh, or we'll go from just uh, one variable to, to multi-variables and, and see how that kind of changes life. But let me just emphasize what we're trying to do here is as good financial risk managers, we're trying to look at that left hand tail and we're trying to say to ourselves, all right, what about those losses in that tail? And we've done some really cool things with value at risk, uh, and shortfall and we're going to do some of that here at the end of this slide deck but we're still trying to add to our understanding of what happens in the extreme cases let's go ahead and start with the basics what what are extreme values this should make perfect sense extreme value is either very small or very large uh, in a probability distribution and so this is a low probability event that has potentially catastrophic effects so look at some of the circle point examples that I have. September 11th, uh, Bear Stearns and others, failure of major institutions, outbreak of politically motivated clashes, uh, and then maybe some earthquakes and uh, other kinds of natural disasters. Uh, whenever I think of natural disasters, I always think of that Bruce Willis movie where the, the asteroid or the meteor or whatever it is coming to attack Earth and they put some kind of a nuclear bomb. Anyway, so think of these extreme values as the results of these extreme events that have a very low probability of occurring. Now, the main challenge posed by these extreme values swings back to what I was saying about my NFL field gold example, right? So 
what did I say? Of the 960 some attempts that were made in 2017, only six of them were attempted from 60 yards and beyond. So we have only a few observations. And so this really, this really inhibits our ability to take a look at the data and extract some valuable information from that data. Now, another interesting point here is that just because somebody has never kicked a 71 yard field goal in the history of the NFL doesn't mean there's a zero chance of that event occurring. The problem then is trying to put a 71 yard field goal into a model in which there's never been a 71 yard field goal. Now, of course, the way the way that uh, risk managers and researchers handle this is by trying to figure out what kind of a distribution is there in either the entire random variable world or just in that left tail world. But look at that circle point I have there. Choosing a distribution arbitrarily, this is probably not going to be the best way to handle extremes because, and let's just think about our ability and our knowledge and our sensitivity to a bell-shaped curve. You know, we're used to we're used to thinking about what's in the meat, what's in the middle of that thing, that point of central tendency. I love giving Seinfeld references. You remember George Costanza interviewed that kid for the scholarship and he made a 2.0 average. He's not shown off, not fallen behind. But that's not what we're concerned about here. We're concerned about the person way, way over there to the left. So look at my last arrow point there. We need an approach that specifically deals with extreme value estimation. Not that we're going to ignore those middle values. We're not going to ignore the mean. We're not going to ignore the standard deviation, but we're much more interested in trying to identify those extreme values and then be able to do something with those values so that we can make a prediction about losses to financial institutions. There's my picture of that bell-shaped curve, so central tendency, there, there we go. But what is that extreme event? Notice it's in red and it's got all the flashes coming out. So the important thing is that this branch of applied statistics is not really governed by that central limit theorem. You know, remember we, we have uh, central limit theorem. We have that guy Chebyshev, that Russian statistician who gave us, you know, the 68% and the 95%. And I think Chebyshev said uh, 75%, all that kind of stuff. Well, extreme value theory is not really going to be based on any of that, although it's going to be something that comes from those kinds of thoughts and those theories. All right, let's look at extreme value theory in finance. So several extreme value theorems. All right, so we have to go back to the 1920s to Fisher and Tippett. And then Gnedenko, this guy wrote some papers back in the 40s and 50s. And so here's really kind of a summary of, of what these three guys came up with. That if we have this sample size and as it gets larger and larger, right, then we're going to have more and more of these extreme values. So we're going to denote those extreme values as uh, the uppercase M and then uh, subscripted N. Uh, this distribution of extremes converges to what we're calling a generalized extreme value distribution. Now, of course, this is used to model either the smallest or the largest value among a set of these random variables, right? Their IID and all that stuff that we've talked about in the past. What we're going to call the largest values are block maximas and the smallest values are going to be called block minimas. And essentially what we're going to try to do is, is be able to answer something that sounds like the following question. We're a financial institution and we have this portfolio of loans out there, we're going to say, okay, over the next 10 days, what's going to be the largest interval? What's going to be the largest loss during that interval? And that sounds an awful lot like value at risk, but what we're going to say is, let's suppose that we have 10 days followed by 10 days followed by 10 days over some extended time period. And then, and only then, are we going to be able to come up with these uh, 
blocks, block maximas and block minimas. And here's, here's a good picture. So take a look at time on the horizontal axis. So we've got from today to 10 days from, to na from now, and then 10 to 20 and 20 to 30 and so on. So we have a 100 day window, but we're chopping those into 10 day increments. And we're going to say something like, OK, what is our largest loss during that 10 day window? And there I have it with, uh, boy, is that red? or some kind of an off red purple. So those are the block maximas. So right, notice there's one for each of those intervals. What we're going to do is we're going to try to come up with a probability density function for those generally generalized extreme values. And we're going to need a mu and we're going to need a sigma. And we're going to need a new parameter. We're going to call this a shape parameter. And this is going to be noted as xi. So there's the probability density function with those three parameters. And note that we need to be careful if that shape parameter is either equal to 0 or uh, not equal to 0. And it's important to remember that that xi is the shape parameter, and that's going to dictate to us. That's going to indicate what the tail looks like. Is it going to be, you know, super close to the horizontal axis, or is it going to be far away from the horizontal axis? Chapter calls this the heaviness of the tail. Now let's take a look at these first two cases, which are going to be the ones that we're going to look at in the next couple of slides. If xi is greater than zero, then the GEV becomes this Frechet distribution in which the tails are heavy. And so think about that T distribution if you have a sample size of, you know, four, five, or six. And also the Pareto distribution does, does this as well. Note what I have written there. This case is particularly relevant for not, for financial returns, most of which tend tend to be heavy tailed. Now, if xi is equal to zero, then the GEV becomes a gumbel distribution in which the tails are light, which is relevant for you know a regular old normal distribution and then probably a log normal distribution as well. But if xi is less than zero, it becomes this Weibull distribution in which the tails are really, really close uh, to the horizontal axis. And it's probably not too relevant. That's why I have that block point down there. Distributions in which xi is less than zero do not often appear in financial models. And so it's probably OK to ignore those. take a look at a quick picture here uh, you know suppose we have some random variable um, and here is a picture of these two distributions notice that the Frechet distribution is tilted just a little bit more back towards the vertical axis and then it has a heavier tail than the gumbel distribution but note with both of these you can get the sense that the the bulk uh, the the probability mass is located between, oh, I don't know, you know, let's just pick some numbers there, you know, a minus two over to a plus five or a plus six. Um, so we're worried about, you know, those tails, but clearly the bulk is in the middle. Um, now, the next step then is for us to obtain the quantiles associated with the GEV distribution. And so we're going to do the Frechet and the Gumbel. Notice we've got xi greater than zero and xi equal to zero. And what we're going to do in this case is we're going to just assume, you know, kind of a standardized distribution where mu is equal to zero and sigma is equal to one. So what I want you to do kind of quickly is get out your calculator. I'll show you, for those of you who want to do this, you can calculate that 95% quantile over there, 2.97. So if you get out your calculator, put, uh, put 0.95 in your calculator, then hit your LN button. And then change your sign, make it negative, and then hit your LN button again. And then you got to change your sign again. You should have 2.97 in there. So you can, you can tell with, uh, with just 
the Gumbel distribution with xi equals zero, that's going to be 2.97. But but look with the Frechette distribution with some kind of an estimate of the shape parameter. Remember the heaviness in the tails, then that 95% quantiles all the way up. Boy, is that not quite doubled, right? It goes from 2.97 up to 4.79. And you can uh, you can if you want to, you can compute that 4.79 using the Frechette uh, equation up at, the, up at the top. And that's how we interpret it, right? So here's just kind of a repeat slide. Um, it's important to remember those probabilities re refer to the probabilities associated with the extreme loss distribution and, and they probably don't have anything to do with that parent loss distribution. That's what I was talking about earlier in my introduction. So let's move on to the value at risk. So what we're going to do is we're going to here. Let me just go back real quickly to those quantile formulas. So all we're going to do is we're going to adjust them just a little bit, right? Whenever we needed to adjust some kind of an equation for value at risk, we just really added an end to it for sample size. So that's really all we're doing, throwing an N in there. And then you can compute these standardized, right? Standardized, assuming, oh, I think we're assuming 100 days. Yeah, there's N of 100 in that middle column. And so we have the 99.5, uh, 99.9 value at risk. So once again, you know, we're looking at the extreme values, you know, 95%, that's not extreme enough for us, 99.9. Uh, the one interesting note that I want you to understand here is on those two far right columns. Notice the difference between the 2.3 and the 3.3 for the 99.9% value at risk. The difference between the Gumbel and the Frechet, those are, you know, that's pretty substantial. But then when we take that shape parameter and we make the tails just a little bit heavier, right, from 0.3 to 0.4, then we're still increasing our value at risk. And so that's probably a good thing to know for an exam is to know the sensitivity of the shape parameter to the value at risk. And that table there at the bottom, that's a really good illustration of just how sensitive it is. And I guess for those of you who like to uh, fool around with your calculator, you could just plug in some other numbers for Xi and get some other value at risk percentages. Now here's the question. How are we going to choose between Gumbel and Frechet? And fortunately, the text provides us with some really clear answers here. And so I have those in the blocks there. So let me go ahead and read these to you. If the researcher can confidently identify the parent distribution, all right, so think of all of those NFL field goals, then they can choose uh, that extreme value distribution that resides in that same, there's that term I used earlier, that same domain of attraction. So it might not be the exact same distribution in the extreme distribution, but they have the same domain of attraction. Ah, here we go. Second one is really cool. The researcher can always test the significance of that tail index and then choose Gumbel or Frechet depending on whether or not that tail index is significant. Now, the other choice is to always just use the conservative method and use the Frechet method. Here's a natural way to kind of figure this out. You know, if you or I were trying to take a look at some extreme values and we had no and we had no background in mathematics at all, we might line them up like this, you know, one, two, three, four. And then we might be able to say, OK, let's take let's take a block maxima. Let's pick the highest in each one of those blocks. You know, that's maybe, you know, week one and two and three and four or however it is. And so we would have four of those block maximas. Right. But then we might say, you know what, look at X three for time period three, and then look over at that first one in time period one, they look an awful lot like they're about the same height. Same thing with the right, the next door neighbor over in the fourth time period. Why is X3 identified as a block maxima and the other two are not, even though they kind of look like they're pretty much the same. 
Well, that's what this peaks over the threshold method tells us to. I mean, this approach says, all right, let's pick a U and let's just draw a line over there. There's the dotted line. And we're going to include any of those losses that exceed that threshold. So instead of having just four under the block maxima approach, we've got seven under the POT approach. Now, one of the attractions of this POT approach, aside from the intuition of which I just just described in that last uh, in that last illustration, is that it probably it doesn't have to, but it probably requires fewer parameters than our extreme value approach. And so what we can do is we can define the distribution of excess losses over our threshold um, using that function down there that I have at the bottom of the page. Now, of course, the next question is, if we're really working for a financial institution, which one of these two do we want to pick? So what we have seen is that risk analysts, they tend to prefer uh, the POT approach over the GEV approach, mostly because the GEV approach involves some loss of useful data. And that's, an Ill, that's uh, the result of what I just showed you in that, here, let me go back, what I just showed you here, there's a loss of some of that data. And that data could be really, really important. I mean, for example, let's go back to my NFL field goal. You know, suppose some dude kicks a 59 and 7 eighths field goal and he does it 10 straight times. It's not quite a 60, but should that one be included in the sample? And, you know, maybe, but that's what we're going to try to do here when we identify which approaches are more important. So what do I have down there in the bottom blue box? Ultimately, the choice between the two boils down to the problem at hand. We have to be practical. We have to be pragmatic. What is the data that is available? Let me just tell you a quick story about uh, some research that I did back when I was still in graduate school. And then I continued on when I got my first teaching job is that I, I collected a sample of about um, 60 or 70 firms that had one particular type of a share repurchase. I did a lot of stuff, uh, statistical tests on this data, stock market stuff, and it was really fun. And my professor kept saying, boy, it'd be nice if you have a higher and a larger sample size. And I'm like, well, this is it. I mean, I went out, I read the Wall Street Journal for thousands of days and I try to figure out. Uh, and so I was pretty confident that I had the entire data set. But, you know, data, the amount of data that's available. I mean, nowadays, if I were to do this going all the way back to 1980, I'd probably not have 60 or 70 data points. You know, I'd probably have a thousand. All right, what happens? Uh, what happens as you, you know, gets larger and larger? And so we've got this GPB theorem. <laughs> that states that the distribution converges to a generalized Pareto distribution given by the functions there, depending on the parameter of xi. Now, what we're worried about then is that this uh, generalized Pareto distribution is only going to have two parameters. It's going to have a scale parameter, beta. And by the way, the textbook, I'm sorry, the chapter refers to a couple of different ways to try to estimate these parameters using things like uh, stuff that we've done in the past, you know, maybe some regression analysis. But then, so that, that scale parameter uh, beta is going to be positive, but the shape parameter, right? The heaviness of the tail, that can be positive or negative or zero, just like we talked about before. Now, this GPD is considered the natural model for excess losses since all of the distributions of excess losses converge right to the, the GPD. But we need to pick a reasonable threshold, right? We don't want to have a threshold of our NFL uh, field goals of 20 yards. That's not extreme, right? 60 yards. That sounds extreme to me. So there's going to be a trade-off. And I've said this to you guys many times before. It many, oftentimes comes down to marginal cost, marginal benefits. I tell that to my children all the time. They're tired of me trying to have them make decisions based uh, on something that sounds pretty simple. But that's, of course, what we're going to do here. 
Now let's swing back just quickly to this value at risk and the shortfall or the expected shortfall. Uh, remember, we called that expected shortfall in a previous chapter. We called that conditional value at risk. And what we're going to do using the POT parameters, we're going to use that equation that I have right there in the middle to be able to compute that value at risk. And then we can rearrange and go to that bottom formula for the expected shortfall. And so my advice to you guys for any exam questions is to not so much memorize these kinds of formulas, but just, just be aware of what value at risk and what expected shortfall are sensitive to. Make sure you know those variables. And then I think the last slide that we have in the slide deck today asks the question, all right, if we want to take a look at that distribution of the extreme value in my football example, you know, why don't coaches try to kick 65 yard field goals regularly? Well, it depends probably on m more than just one variable. I mean, of course, the overriding variable is the strength of the leg of the field goal kicker, right? I mean, if some dude can boot it 100 yards, then we're going to try it. But if he can only boot it 50 yards, then we're probably not going to try a 60-yard field goal. So those people who make and attempt those 60 to 70-yard field goals probably have the strongest legs, right? But there are other variables that are probably important, like is it in the middle of winter in Green Bay and there's 10 feet of snow on the ground, we're probably not going to try an extreme value uh, attempt. All right, so notice in the middle there, I have tail dependence refers to clustering of extreme events. And, and this multivariate EVT tells us that these extreme events are not independent. And so uh, extreme losses for a financial institution who writes insurance contracts. Uh, let's suppose that let's suppose we're an insurance company and all, all we do is write contracts for uh, holes in one in golf tournaments. You know, those of you who are golfers will know you play in a tournament and there'll be a hole like a par three and they'll say, hey, if you get a hole in one here, you get a thousand dollars or you win a trip to Alaska or win a free car, whatever it is. So let's suppose we're this insurance company and this is all we do. Right. And so what's going to determine the premiums that we charge each golf course or golf event? Right. I mean, if it's a hundred yard par three, are we going to charge the same premium, whether that event is held in Pennsylvania in August or in Tennessee in January? And the answer is probably not. Yes, we're, we're probably going to charge different premiums for lots and lots of different variables. Weather, skill set, terrain, you know, uh, humidity, all that kind of stuff is going to play a role in in that uh, in the determination of the premium that we that we charge. And then it's going to be relevant for those extreme losses, right? Suppose that we have 10 golf tournaments in one day and there are 20 holes in one. That's an extreme event. So we need to use this multivariate EVT to protect us protect us from these, uh, you know, a tidal wave of events. Wasn't there a movie made about that? So notice the example I have there. So we have we have a major earthquake that can trigger other natural or financial disasters. And that takes us through those learning objectives. And uh, I hope you're saying to yourself, hey, that wasn't so bad after all.